Welcome to Global Dispatches, a podcast for the foreign policy and global development communities and anyone who wants a deeper understanding of what is driving events in the world today. I'm your host, Mark Leon Goldberg, editor of UN Dispatch. Enjoy the show. I met my guest today, Sally Hayden, a few years back at a journalism fellowship program pegged to the United Nations General Assembly. I remember sitting next to her at a press briefing, and while we waited for it to begin, she showed me WhatsApp messages she'd been receiving from prisoners in a migrant detention facility in Libya. Those messaging her were mostly East Africans who had been apprehended at sea trying to make it to Europe. Now they were languishing indefinitely in a prison in a country in the midst of a civil war. Little did I know at the time, but those messages would prompt Sally Hayden to embark on an ambitious reporting project seeking to trace the lives of those with whom she was exchanging texts. This led to her brand new book, My Fourth Time We Drowned, Seeking Refuge on the World's Deadliest Migration Route. We kick off discussing how it is that she first started receiving messages from migrants trapped in a Libyan prison before having a broader conversation about the lives she profiles and how the European Union is partly responsible for this human rights disaster. Her book is tremendous, an excellent piece of writing, well worth your time, and I'll post a link to it in the show notes of this episode. And as always, feel free to reach out to me if you have suggestions of people I should interview or topics I should cover. I love hearing from you. I love getting your ideas. They often inspire the content that you hear on this podcast. So thank you in advance for reaching out to me. All right. Now here is my conversation with journalist Sally Hayden, author of My Fourth Time We Drowned. So I had been reporting on migration for a few years before, but um, this was still pretty unexpected to me. I got a message on Facebook. Uh, It said basically, hi, Sister Sally, we need your help. Um, We're trapped in a a Libyan prison. If you have time, I'll tell you all the story. So I uh, kind of didn't take it too seriously (laughs) Um, just because I didn't. You know, I was thinking if someone, if this person's in a Libyan prison, like, why are they contacting me? How do they have my name and all of this? But um, but I responded, of course, because I guess as a journalist, that's kind of what you do. So I said, uh, I can't help, but can you tell me, like, I'm happy to talk to you about it. And this guy who um, was messaging me basically said that there were 500 of them, men, women and children who had been abandoned in what he called a prison. It was it turned out a migrant detention center in Tripoli and that conflict had broken out around them and essentially that they had you know they were running out of food and water or they had um you know they were worried about that they had been held in two separate areas the men and the women but they had broken down the doors between them after they were effectively abandoned and so uh you know I I was wondering is this real I started contacting uh the first I think the first person I contacted was a Libyan journalist actually I knew who was in Tripoli and I said is this true like has a conflict just broken out and you know what would there be refugees locked up in this area of Tripoli and he said yes a conflict did just break out and yes there would be people locked up there um and so from that point I kind of went okay maybe this is real So I asked for, you know, whatever I could get to verify the story, like things like selfies, GPS location, um, even numbers of this guy's family members, just to, you know, try and figure out was this real. And I started contacting as well, just different NGOs, the UN, just also just asking first, is this real? Secondly, can you actually do anything about this? Um, And yeah, that was how this story started. That kind of let me, I mean, it's crazy that I met you at that time because it was only a few weeks into me reporting on it. And this is nearly now four years later. Um, And yeah, it's been a, 
you know, it's it's basically taken over my life for the last four years. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember you showing me those messages on, I think it was WhatsApp that you were exchanging with uh, that man inside that Libyan detention center. And it's just like harrowing. It was really um, both like intense, like deeply disturbing on like a, just like a human level. And also it, it, you know, it seems like what, what could you as like an individual at that time we were in New York, you know, do about the situation? Yeah, exactly. And that's, I mean, for me, I'm a journalist, you know, all I can really do is report, but yeah, we were at the uh, the UN General Assembly, I remember, <laughs> probably was pissing off everyone else in the room because I was just asking every question about what was happening with these refugees in Libya. And um, and it did turn out, I mean, but at that stage, it had been a few weeks. So initially, I had kind of thought that this was an isolated incident. And it turned out that, no, there were actually detention centres all over Tripoli where, you know, more refugees were in in a similar situation so it wasn't just this one case it was like actually thousands of people who were in this situation um and yeah for me it was shocking because I had heard about this before a bit but I didn't properly understand it it was one year after the EU started supporting the Libyan Coast Guard so basically uh if refugees or migrants as well try and cross the Mediterranean Sea to reach Europe, they um, were then getting intercepted by the Libyan Coast Guard, which is essentially a way to kind of circumnavigate international law because European vessels can't return people to a place where their life is in danger, so they couldn't return them to Libya. But if it's the Libyan Coast Guard that intercept the boats, they can return them to Libya. So you basically had you know, thousands of people who were caught at sea. I mean, now like close to, or now like 90,000, I mean, even close to 100,000, like, but you had, um, yeah, you had like at that stage, thousands of people who had been caught at sea and forced back to Libya. And then they just get locked up indefinitely. They don't have any legal recourse to get out of those detention centers. So then when something like a conflict breaks out, you know, they're just stuck there still. (laughs) They're just abandoned. And what did you learn about how the people with whom you were messaging in that detention center in Libya in in 2018, how did they end up there? Yeah, so that was exactly it. They had fled. um, A lot of them are Eritreans. So they fled kind of the dictatorship there where I'm sure like pretty much all your listeners know there's kind of mandatory uh, military service that can last pretty indefinitely you know the UN has called it slavery like um, and people flee that dictatorship or some of them were like Somalis they had fled you know conflict or Al-Shabaab or um, some of them were from Darfur Sudan or South Sudan as well where there was conflict so it was a lot of people kind of fleeing war and repression or yeah and dictatorships Um, And they had tried, they had, most of them had spent at least a year with smugglers, because basically when you get to Libya, then you get held for ransom. So even if you've negotiated one fee, that fee will be multiplied once you actually reach Libya and and you can be held and tortured and, you know, that ransom is extracted from your family. So by the time they actually reached the sea, that was like at least one year into the journey generally. Um, and then at that point, they try and cross the sea to get to Italy or to Malta. And then the boats were getting intercepted by the Libyan Coast Guard. And that's the point when they got pushed back and locked up in these detention centers again indefinitely. So, um, so yeah, that, that was what they had been through. So, you know, I didn't understand that before either, that actually this was, you know, at this point, they had already been on the road like at least a year, some two years, some three years trying to seek safety. And after having, you know, made it all the way to Libya, heading made on it on a boat, they are intercepted by the Libyan Coast Guard, which, you know, I, I take it as more like a seafaring militia uh, that's supported by the European Union, funded by the European Union uh, to evade, as you said, international or laws that European Union countries abide to, uh, abide by. And so, you know, migrants are, are locked up in these detention centers indefinitely. Um, the people that you were messaging with, what happened to them? 
So actually, it's strange because now it's obviously four years on. Some of them I've actually met in person. They have managed to make it to Europe. Um, and that was either through some of them on rescue ships. Eventually, they, they managed to go to sea again. And they this time did um, get rescued by like the independent European ships. Or actually, one guy even just sailed all the way to Malta, um, which sounded like a, you know, a very long journey. Or uh, some of them were chosen for this UN resettlement, like evacuation and then resettlement program, which is a small percentage of people, but still some people go through that um, and they've made it to Europe. And then others are just still in Libya or um, I mean, it's hard to say because there are people who have dropped out of contact with me and I don't know what happened to them. And, you know, of course, I hope that they didn't die, but like, that is also a possibility because I was in touch with a lot of people and um, and I have lost touch with quite a number of them. But yeah, it's been it's been nice to meet the ones that I actually got to meet in person. Well, that was really lovely. Well, well, to that end, can you tell the story of Caleb? Yeah, sure. Um, so he is an Eritrean, but um, but spent like yeah, kind of came of age in Ethiopia and didn't really have you know he, he was a refugee there he didn't have the correct documents he kind of knew that his future was very limited um and you know there's all sorts of risks that you live when you live as a refugee in a different country particularly Eritrea and Ethiopia you know sometimes the relationship is fraught so you don't necessarily feel like you're on a secure footing um even if you have that refugee status and so for him he then decided, you know, basically he was going to try and get to Europe. Like maybe that was the only way that he could have a good future. So he set off on this journey, um, ended up in Libya, stayed with a smuggler. He, he went with one smuggler then actually, which is a terrible story. The first smuggler effectively gambled them away. A lot of the you know, the smuggling routes, there is like different levels to them. And so you have the very top people who often aren't even present in Libya, who have like people below them and people below them and people below them. So like organized crime, uh, basically. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, so this the top smuggler was in Dubai. And what they were told was that he had actually gambled them away, like a group of hundreds of them got gambled so um he had to pay twice uh, a ransom of like thousands of dollars two times like so this uh, first to the first smuggler and then again to who he was gambled to um then he went to sea was intercepted the first time managed to pay out of a detention center went to sea again got intercepted again got locked up and that was the point when i um became in touch with him and so he was um yeah, he was in that first detention center where they contacted me from. And what was his fate? So he actually has made it to Europe. He's in Luxembourg now. Um, that took him, I think, it, almost a year from the time that he that they first contacted me. That was when I met him in person. But at that point, that had been two years I think more than two years since he set off on the initial journey and he was taken through the evacuation uh, scheme so he was actually evacuated to Italy um, and then he basically kind of realized that in Italy there are so many refugees and the prospects again are like very limited and he did what a, what a lot of actually the people evacuated from Libya to Italy do, which is just went to a different country and claimed asylum there. Um, and and what, was, what was it like to, to meet him in person after having been in touch with him for so long? It was very strange. Um, and we talked, I think the first time we talked was for like 10 hours or something like that. We just walked around and talked because even me then I was at that stage, I had been reporting on this for nearly a year. I was talking to refugees in Libyan detention centers every single day, um, particularly at night, because a lot of them were using hidden phones. So like I'd stay up late at night and be messaging them. You know, they'd be updating me on what had happened that day. Um, and so I had had this very strange year where I had never actually met. So I had met relatives of people in detention that I was in touch with, but I had never met someone themselves. And so 
it was very you know it was just me asking is this real is this real like tell me more about this like so yeah for me as well it was even though you know you do your due diligence as a journalist you know you still when you actually see someone in person it's still kind of is there's still a part of you that's going can this can this really be true and yeah obviously it was so because of, of your reporting uh, and reporting of other journalists as well, um, you were you're the, the first one I, I had ever sort of uh, seen on this story. Uh, has there been any change to the European Union's policy of supporting the Libyan Coast Guard in intercepting uh, Af- mostly African migrants from reaching Europe and then detaining them you know, indefinitely in these detention centers? No, um, no, there hasn't. And that's been, I mean, I think I was very naive when I started reporting. I was thinking, you know, we just need to make people aware of this and then it's probably going to stop. But um, but I was thinking that they weren't necessarily aware of the consequences. But actually, yeah, um, that hasn't stopped. And there's a lot of roundabout logic for that. I mean, when you hear EU officials talk about it, first they say they don't support detention. They want the detention centers closed. Um, secondly they'll say that the support for the coast guard is part of like tackling the business model of smugglers and so they say that you know this is an attempt at saving lives but what I realized quite quickly through my reporting is that there's not actually you know for example I interviewed Frontex and the spokeswoman for Frontex told me it's not their responsibility once people are intercepted by the Libyan coast guard they don't for example monitor how many people then die in Libya so, you know, you can say you're saving lives because you're not gathering the statistics that show you that what people are going through after that point. Um, so, yeah, it's, you know, it, it, all these things are quite complex, but at the same stage, like for me, it's at that point of interception, that's where I think that the EU is undeniably ethically culpable for what happens after that point. And so I wrote the book because I want I wanted to document what was happening from that point. And I became very aware that that wasn't being properly recorded. And, and your book is just full of, of stories and anecdotes and, and sort of personal accounts of, of people on that journey facing that really sort of harrowing experience of, of being intercepted by the, the Libyan Coast Guard on their way to Europe. But from stepping stepping back from the individual stories, what have the trends been in recent years or or months? Are the number of attempted sea crossings by refugees and migrants relatively stable or increasing or, or decreasing? I know the number of interceptions um, has hugely increased. Um, I'm not sure if the total number of attempted crossings. Uh, I'd need to get the latest statistics but I know that the number of interceptions I mean last year I think it was like 30,000 people um so it's gone up like it's going up very significantly basically and um yeah I, it's tricky because you have obviously waves of you know the the way basically migration works is that when one route kind of gets shut down and people will shift to another route and so there was a period of time where as many people weren't coming to Libya, which actually meant that the people who were already there were kind of being exploited a lot more because, for example, the smugglers weren't making money off new arrivals. So they were just selling the ones who were already there between each other and exploiting them again and again and again. But now I think, especially with the uh, war in Tigray, you know, you have a series of crises that are going on across um, East Africa and the Horn of Africa. And from what I'm hearing anyway, through refugees, like that's, you know, the numbers that are arriving are now going up and up again. Um, and that's, you know, that makes sense. <laughs> like, because there's so many people who have even fled into Sudan, you know, and, um, you know, there are people escaping from, from countries there who are just looking for any route to safety. And so, yeah, of course, they'll, they'll try what they can. So I'm interested in, in getting your perspective as you know a European journalist who's covered migration and refugee issues primarily from, from the Middle East and, and North Africa and um, the the kind of sort of Sahel region, East Africa, where, where you are now. Um, you're seeing you know today this huge 
migration refugee crisis in Europe um, from Ukrainians who are, are fleeing. And it seems at least that European countries are, are doing the right thing. They're, they're opening their doors. Um, civil society is kicking into gear to, to welcome them. Governments are, are supporting them really seemingly robustly. Like what does that sort of juxtaposition of, you know, refugees being treated appropriately as they're fleeing Ukraine, uh, whereas refugees being locked up indefinitely in these hellish detention centers in, in Libya. What, what does that tell you about how we as like an international community approach international migration and refugee issues? Yeah, I mean, I think it's been um, quite astounding, to be honest, like quite shocking, I think, for people who work on uh, or who have been working on what's happening on Europe's borders and what's happening to people trying to seek um, refuge or asylum. And, you know, of course, it's good. <laughs> like, it's very good that the Ukrainians are being welcomed. And also, I would say, like, I hope it lasts as well, because we have seen, like, different moments where there it has seemed like there is going to be more empathetic policy or more empathetic welcomes at least for example for Syrians um after the death of Alan Kurdi and that hasn't lasted and so first of all I do hope that it lasts for the Ukrainians secondly I mean yeah it's it, you know I've spoken to Eritreans, for example, about this, like refugees who have gone through this very horrific journey and been locked in detention, one who almost died in a detention center from tuberculosis. And he was like, this is just racism. Like, it's very clearly racism. And um, I know, of course, there are geopolitical reasons for welcoming Ukrainians as well. But I do think that you know, more than 3 million, I think now have crossed the border into the EU. And if you think about 2015, it was 1.3 million um, people that claimed asylum. And that was the year of, you know, the so-called European migrant crisis. Um, and that was kind of the year that shifted all this movement towards hardening Europe's borders. And, you know, that number now doesn't seem so large when you think about it. Um, I don't know, I've, I've spoken to other journalists who report on similar issues and some of them said actually this makes them feel a glimmer of hope because it's shown them that a more empathetic policy is possible and I think also for a lot of Europeans it's made them realize that you know something that something like war can can break out suddenly out of nowhere and can force you to to escape your home you know and potentially has given them a bit more understanding for the fact that that is something that can happen. Um, but yeah, I just hope that, you know, that the same understanding is also now given to Africans or to people fleeing other conflicts or dictatorships as well. Uh, I think the other thing I would say is I've heard the arguments, you know, uh, for example, one person um, was saying, you know, well, Ukraine, we have shared history with them in Europe. Um, and I found that a bit ironic that like a lot of the Africans who I've been interviewing are coming from what were former European colonies, you know, like countries that were very badly exploited by Europe. And I, so I think that also counts as shared history. Uh, well, Sally, thank you so much for your time and for your tremendous book. Yeah. And thank you so much for having me as well. I really appreciate this. All right. Thank you all for listening. Thank you to Sally Hayden for her time. And again, it's an excellent book. I will post a link to it in the show notes of this episode. All right. Thanks all. We'll see you next time. Bye.